standing and we'll read from the scriptures. It's Luke chapter 19, verses 11 through 27. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem and they, were, they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So he said, A nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called ten of his slaves and gave them ten minas and said to them, Do business with this until I come back. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. The first appeared saying, Master, your mina has made 10 minas more. And he said to him, well done, good slave, because you have been faithful in a very little thing. You are to be in authority over 10 cities. The second came saying, Your mina, master, has made five minas. And he said to him also, And you are to be over five cities. Another came, saying, Master, here is your mina, which I kept put away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you, because you are an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, By your own words I will judge you, you worthless slave. Did you know that I am an exacting man, taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow? Then why did you not put my money in the bank? And having come, I would have collected it with interest. Then he said to the bystanders, take the mina from him and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to him, Master, he has ten minas already. I tell you that to everyone who has, more shall be given, but from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. So turn your Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 19. We continue in our study of this tremendous gospel. Luke chapter 19. <clears throat> somewhat familiar parable. We did not say much about this last Sunday, but that was on the calendar called Reformation Sunday. And October 31st is Reformation Day. If you look at your calendar, you might have seen that. Basically, it's when we commemorate and remember a very important date in church history when God used the Reformers, Martin Luther and others, to spur the church to return to the doctrine of faith alone in Christ alone. Sola Scriptura, not the authority of popes, but the authority of Scripture. Faith alone in Christ alone. A man is made right with God by faith in Christ alone. Our church and many others come out of the roots of the Reformation We hold firmly to that truth. Salvation is a free gift of God, not of our works. We are justified not by works, but by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. We hold to that. And so, as clear as we are about that, and want to be about that, we ask this question, How do good works fit into the picture? They do not save us, but what role do they play? Are they essential? Are they required? Are they just icing on the cake, and you can take your cake and eat it any way you want? Is that what good works are to justification by faith? Is that what good works are to the Christian life? Take it or leave it. What is our motivation? This passage this morning, I think, provides us some motivation. It provides us with the information that there is coming a future judgment and a future reward. Based upon 
works is a judgment according to our works. What you do, what you do. It's a judgment for both believers and unbelievers. And undoubtedly, the outcome for believers is different than the outcome for unbelievers. But this is a major truth of Scripture. We don't talk about it enough. But this has to do with a judgment regarding works. We can't neglect this, folks. We can't neglect this topic. And it comes right after our previous passage we studied last week. Jesus talks about a parable, interesting parable, a time when Christ will return to earth and he will come back as the king of all the earth. Look at Luke 19. Luke tap, verse 11. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable. Because he was near Jerusalem and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. Jesus, with a large crowd of pilgrims, a large crowd of people, Jews, on their way to Jerusalem for Passover. They're about a week away from the crucifixion. This is the festival that is one of the most important in Judaism. This is one where national pride is very high. And they're thinking, this is it. This is it. We have seen all the evidence. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. He healed, he healed two blind men in Jericho. He, he saved this tax gatherer. All the other miracles, all the other things he's said for the last three years, this man is definitely the Messiah. And we're going to Jerusalem, and when we get there, we're going to have a coronation. See that in that verse? The kingdom of God is going to appear immediately. That's what they're thinking. They believe this is the Messiah. This is the Messiah, and with the Messiah, you get a kingdom. And Jesus is Messiah, therefore he is going to establish his reign once we get there. And then see, they knew that the Messiah was going to be a great king. He's a descendant of David. He's going to rule over God's people. He's going to rule over Israel. He's going to rule over every nation of the world. The promises in the Bible are clear. Psalm 2, 8, Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. That is God speaking to the Messiah. The nations are your inheritance. The whole earth is your possession. You will rule over all of it. There's nothing wrong with the people's theology in expecting the Messiah to do this. Messiah means kingdom, no doubt. But what they fail to understand is the timing is wrong. The timing is wrong. It's not going to happen. See the word immediately. In verse 19, it's not going to happen immediately. The word appear immediately. It's not on the horizon to happen immediately. There's going to be an interim between the first coming and the second coming. They didn't know anything about a first coming and a second coming, even though it's in the scripture. They knew all the verses about the literal kingdom of the Messiah, but they did not seem to register, or did not seem to register with their Teflon minds that the Messiah must come and suffer and die. That he must take a, go to a cross and, and be crucified. That did not register, no matter how many times Jesus told them. And so there's nothing wrong with their theology in expecting a kingdom. What's wrong here is that they've got the timing wrong. And that's what this parable does. This guys, guys, you're going to be living in an interim period. You're going to be living in a time between my first coming and my second coming. And that's what he tells them in this parable. They didn't read Isaiah 53. 
and Psalm 22 and the whole sacrificial system that spoke of a Messiah who was going to be crucified, a Messiah who was going to be suffering and die. I mean, they heard Jesus say in Luke 19.10, the Son of Man comes to seek and to save that which is lost. That's what they were listening to him saying, verse, 9, verse 11. They just heard him say that back in verse 10, one verse prior. See, Messiah did not come the first time to change the political situation in Judea. He didn't come the first time to change the economic situation in Judea. He did not come the first time to change the, all the social inequities in Judea. He did not come to change the environment in his first coming. He did not come to do any of that. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. His second coming, he will do all the, all the things I just mentioned. He will change the political situation. He will change the economic situation. He will change the social situation. And he will change the environment. In fact, there will be a garden in the desert. And the lamb will lay down with the lion. That's the second coming. They missed that. He talked about the kingdom has come inwardly, Luke 17. And there's an inward kingdom now. If you're a Christian, if you're a believer, the kingdom is in you. Luke 17, 23 and following. But there's also an external kingdom coming one day. Hard concept for these disciples to get. But they're on their way to Jerusalem. They're expecting a kingdom. They're expecting it to appear. See the word immediately. And so in response to these expectations, he tells them a parable about himself. And this parable is basically Jesus saying, sometime in the future, I'm going to return and I'm going to rule as king over the earth, the whole earth. Sometime in the future, I will do that, but not now. That's what this parable tells them. Verse 12. So here's the parable. He said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. See that? A nobleman goes to a far country to receive a kingdom. That's the reason he goes to a far country, to receive the kingdom. And then he's going to return and rule over his country. It's a parable. Remember, parables are stories Jesus tells he uses familiar events to teach unfamiliar things. That's the purpose of a parable. It's a teaching tool that Jesus would use. Something familiar. There's something familiar to them about this parable that he's using to teach them some unfamiliar things. In this parable, Jesus is talking about a nobleman who leaves and goes to a distant country to get his kingdom. And while he is away, before he leaves, he calls his servants to him. And he tells his servants, these are some minas, money, about three months' wages. He gives to each of them, these three servants. And while he's away, he says, I want you to be pragmatic. I want you to earn profits. I want you to do business with this money. And when he gets back, he's going to evaluate how everyone has done. You notice in verse 14, look at verse 14. There are actually some people in the kingdom that don't want this man to reign over them. These citizens do not want this man to reign over them. He's got some servants that he gives the meanest to. And then there's some citizens that don't want this man to reign over them. It's a parable. It's a parable. It's a story. Jesus is drawing from a historical event, folks. Follow me now. It's from, here's the familiar side to this parable. Rome ruled over this region. 
Caesar. Caesar in Rome was the superior, ultimate king of the whole region. As far as the empire went, he ruled over all of it. Rome wisely allowed subordinate kings, get this, allowed subordinate kings to rule over their own particular homeland. Wise thing to do. You had all these different customs. You had all these different races of people. Rome would allow a subordinate king from that region to rule over their people. According to history, historian Josephus, in 40 BC, before the birth of Christ, Herod the Great, Herod the Great went to the Roman Caesar to get permission to be the king of Judea. He was the king at the time of the birth of Christ. But he had to go to Rome to get permission to do that, to negotiate that deal. After he died, his kingdom of Judea was divided between his three sons. The king that would rule over this area right here, where they're at in Judea, was Archelaus. Archelaus, at the death of his father, became the king of Judea, at least in a temporary position because he had to go to Rome He'd have to go to Rome to negotiate the deal. So he immediately takes over, just for a very short time, but to be recognized by Rome and to get the title of king, he needed to go to Rome to do that. I hope I'm saying things right here. But he went to Rome to do that. What's significant about this is there were people that hated Archelaus, in his own family even, Jews and Gentiles, who followed him to Rome when he went there to negotiate with Caesar so he could be the king of Judea. That's the people in verse 14. They hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we don't want this man to reign over us. And that's what they did. They followed him up there and tried to get Caesar to say no. Well, Caesar says yes, but he doesn't let him be called a king. It's more like an ethnarch. He doesn't get to be called a full king. But he comes back to rule in Judea. You see the parallel going on here? You see the parallel going on here? The nobleman comes back to his own country to rule his country. That's the familiar. They're familiar with that. They're familiar with Archelaus doing that. Jesus is on the road to Jericho, from Jericho, and there's Archelaus' winter palace sitting there. Just like Jesus would take farming illustrations and business illustrations to teach a truth, he's using Archelaus and, and the whole Roman system of letting people be kings and all of that be his illustration for what he's trying to teach them about the fact that he himself is the nobleman that's going to leave and come back. He's going to leave to go get his kingdom and then come back. Read verse 12, 12 again. A nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. He's trying to tell his disciples, my kingdom is not immediate. Think of Archelaus and what he had to do. That is what I have to do. I have to go to a distant place, receive my kingdom, and come back. The word nobleman means high birth man. That certainly qualifies Christ to be this nobleman. I'm going to dwell, Christ came and dwelt upon the earth for a period of time. And then at his ascension, he leaves for a period of time. It's been a long time. But he's going to return. He's going to return. You see that, verse 12. He's going to return with his kingdom. 
We thought the kingdom was going to be immediate. No. Think of Archelaus and what happened to him. Same thing with me. I'm going to go away to a distant place, receive my kingdom, and then come back. And I will come with full authority to rule. In verse, Revelation eleven fifteen 15 says, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. That's what we're looking forward to, right? When he will reign forever and ever on this earth. He's talking about the whole world, too. Understand this. He's talking about everybody on the planet. He's not just talking in this parable. He's not just talking about people who follow him. He's talking about people who claim to follow him. And he's talking about people who are his enemies. He's talking about true servants, false servants, and enemies. So my point is, all of you are in this parable somewhere. Either a servant, a false servant, or an enemy. When Jesus comes back, he's going to be the king over the whole earth. Understand that. I don't care what you think about Jesus this morning. You will one day bow your knee to him. Everybody will. Everybody will. You may hate him today. It doesn't matter. You're still going to bow your knee to him one day. He's going to come back to rule. Okay, look at verses 13 through 15. When he comes back, and and this is where we start to talk about how works fit into the picture, okay? Beginning in verse 13. And when he comes back, he's going to judge people according to their deeds. He called, this is before he leaves. He calls ten slaves before he leaves. He calls ten slaves and gave them ten minas and said to them, do business with this until I come back. A slave is a servant. These are citizens. These are his servants. And he gives each one a mina, which is equivalent to a um, hundred drachmas, which is a daily weight laborer's wage. So we're talking about three months' wages here for a daily laborer. Not a whole lot, really. But he gives each of them that much to do business with. The word is pragmatic, to, to use in whatever way, to make a profit for your king, to show that you honor and love your king. Use these resources I'm giving you to do that while I am gone. If you have any commitment to me whatsoever, make something of this opportunity during this interim period. Make some, make something of this opportunity. Honor honor your nobleman. Honor the nobleman while he is away that you love and respect him. It's a, it's a test. It's a really a test. Because it will reveal who loves him. <laughs> and it's all built on the historical situation of Archelaus. Just think about him, what he did. Nobody liked him. He wasn't worthy of anything. Verse 14, like I said before, there were some people that did not like him, Archelaus. But guess what? There were people that don't like Jesus either. Like I said, they make appeals to the king who was going to crown him. They hated him, but everybody belongs in the kingdom. I don't care if you're atheist or Buddhist or Muslim or whatever. Listen, listen, listen. This is his world. He made you and he owns you. He owns you. (laughs) But you may be saying in your heart, I don't want this man to reign over me. In fact, that's what they say at his trial. Caesar's our king, not this man. That wasn't true either. They didn't like Caesar anymore, but at least it's better than him, I guess. If you reject Christ, he still has everything to do with you. At some point, he's going to 
judge you. He will judge you according to your works. They didn't succeed in getting Archelaus off the throne. And you know what? You're not going to succeed in getting Jesus off the throne either. He's going to come back to rule. Verse 15, when he returned. Okay, now, now the second coming. He returns after he's received the kingdom. That happened to Archelaus, but it's hadn't happened to Christ as well. At his second coming, he's going to come back to establish his kingdom, to set up his kingdom. Then he calls those slaves whom he had given the money so that he might know what business had been done with it. Revelation 19 is all about the second coming. Jesus is coming back. And he takes, calls those who profess to know him and to find out what they've done. They must appear before him. You say, Rod, I really have never heard this doctrine before. Let me remind you of some places, okay? Judgment according to deeds. Where have we seen this before? Matthew 16, 27. The Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and then will repay every man according to his deeds. That's Matthew 16, 27. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 10. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him, to be pleasing to him. For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done. John 5, 28, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth, and those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, and those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. So, when Christ comes back, the second coming, to judge, according to works, he is going to reveal varying levels of obedience, and he's going to Give out varying rewards. That's what this parable is teaching. Look, in verse 16. The first servant appeared saying, Master, your mina has made ten times more. I love the way he says this. Your mina, not mine. I can take no credit for this. You created this situation. Inherent in this mina is that it grows. You gave me something that grows. Your power, your influence, it did this. I love the way he says that. Your Mina. He says, well done, good slave, because you have been faithful in a very little thing. You are to be authority over ten cities. He says, basically, uh, you're going to rule and have millennial blessing in my kingdom and reign with him. The second slave comes and says, your mina, same thing, your mina, master, has made five minas. It's multiplied itself. And not everybody has the same opportunity, but the point is both of these individuals were faithful. That's what he's saying in verse 17. You have been faithful in a very little thing. He said in verse 19, and he said to him also, And you are to be over five cities. Two faithful servants loved their master, honored him. They showed love and commitment, and he rewards them. And you can go and read 1 Corinthians 3. Foundation has been laid, and we build on that foundation. Works, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble burned up by fire. You can read all kinds of things like that. Regarding works. I just want to make some clarification though. And I'll make sure you understand this. These two individuals are believers. I want you to understand, if you're a Christian, you have no fear 
of condemnation. Understand that. If you're a Christian, there is no condemnation for you in Christ Jesus. You stand before him clothed in the righteousness of Christ. You stand before him with no fear of judgment whatsoever in terms of your eternal salvation. His, he lived the perfect life for you that you could never live, and we simply come before him ready for reward and ready for blessing. Fruit brings glory to God, brings glory to Christ, it all comes from him in the first place. It's not human skill. It's not human righteousness. It's, Lord, it's your mina. Lord, it's what you have done. Lord, it's what I have nothing to offer you, but what you have provided me. My resources and my gifts I have been given to me by you, and I use them for your name. That is the attitude, folks, of a true believer. It's little things, and I want to emphasize this, it's little things, you have been faithful in little things, and your reward is much, There's, it's out of balance proportionally, we do little things, and he rewards us much. If you even give a cup of cold water, he says, in my name, d don't minimize the little things that we do in Christ's name. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That is the desire of a true believer, to put God on display, to do things not for my glory, but for his glory. Oh, I don't do this perfectly, and you don't either. My pride and my selfishness get in the way of that. My motives are not always right, and neither are yours. But the point is, in the heart of a true believer, there is a recognition that he provides everything I have, and everything I have, I give back to him, to his praise, and to his glory. Everything I do in his name. Seeing people in need and showing love and mercy to them. Hearing about children in Russia and putting money in a box. Hearing about individuals and single moms and, and, and their struggles and, and raising their children and you going alongside to help them. Having people in your home and showing hospitality because you love Christ and you want to reach out to other people. Sharing the gospel with somebody, speaking up for Christ. Just depending on God and not on yourself. Trusting him to meet your needs, not trusting in yourself. Folks, we don't do any of this perfectly, but that is the hard attitude of the true believer. We want to make much of the king. A true believer does not want the attention and the glory. A true believer wants to give glory to Christ, give glory to the king. I pray that's your hard attitude. I know you don't do it perfectly, but that should be our hard attitude if you truly know Christ. And so, so the judgment reveals whether your faith is genuine or not. That's what this judgment does. It reveals whether faith is genuine. Deeds do not save us. These works do not save us. None of the things we do save us. They are the result of our salvation. We have a faith in Christ, a faith that works. It's the evidences of our faith. It reveals the genuineness of our salvation. This judgment we're talking about at the second coming is not about our standing before God. It's about the reward as he rewards us. Con contrast that to verse 20. Another came saying, Master, here is your mina, which I kept put away in a handkerchief. See, this individual, the word another, there's two Greek words in the, in the word 
for the word another. Another could be one of the same kind or one different than the others. This is the Greek word that heterogeneous. This is the Greek word for different. This one's different than the others. This, this slave, this servant is different than the other two. He's not of the same group. If you want to say he's of the same group, he'd use the other word. But he's not. This guy's of a different group. Not orthodox. And basically what he is saying is, I kept it put away in a handkerchief. Basically he's saying, I couldn't be bothered. Basically he's saying, I have no desire to prove myself worthy or to please you in any way. To honor you. I, I had no desire to do that. I didn't take those kind of resources and use them like that. For Notice what he says in verse 21. For I was afraid of you because you are an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down and reap what you did not sow. Basically, basically he is saying, you make everybody else do the work and you get all the glory. What believer would ever say that to God? But that's what he's saying. You're, you just want all the glory, and you don't do all the work, and you just want us to do all the work. That sounds like a legalist. I just do all this stuff, God, and you... It's not a true believer. Not a true believer at all. Not driven by love, but by fear. You're strict. You're ungracious. He's just what he's saying to God. Uh, he said, I basically, I was afraid I would lose it. Um... So that's why I put it in a handkerchief. I didn't want to lose it. He didn't have love for the nobleman. No relationship with the nobleman. Doesn't care. In, in this case, he doesn't care about Jesus. He, you know what, folks? He, he's not called one of the citizens. not called one of the enemies. He's going to be placed in the same judgment as the enemies, but he's not called one of the enemies because this is one of those like Judas, who I believe... Like the ten virgins, no oil in the lamp situation, the tares and the wheat situation. And Jesus starts talking a lot about that there are going to be people who profess to know Christ, but they really don't know Christ. And this particular judgment that we're looking at here at the second coming will reveal those who do not know Christ. That is the purpose, really. That is what is going to happen when he comes. The harvest is to reveal those who do know him and those who do not know him, the sheep and the goats. He calls Jesus a thief. He calls Jesus a liar. No desire to honor the king whatsoever. Verse 22, Jesus says to him, by your own words, I will judge you, you worthless slave. You would never call a believer that. This man's not a believer. Did you know that I am an exacting, if you really believe that I am an exacting man, taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow, if you would think that about me, he really calls his hand here, folks. He calls his hand. He says, if you really think that about me, then verse 23, and you're so afraid of me, verse 23, then why didn't you put my money in the bank? Why didn't you go to the lender's table and give him my money? And let him loan it out at a higher interest and at least collect a lower interest on it. Why didn't you do that if, I, if you're so afraid of me? So he just, he just corners him with his own words there. So early banking system starting up there. You see it? Yeah. Lame excuse. But see, there are people like this in the church today. Superficial pretense, hypocrisy. They, have, they do nothing. They hear about the spiritual side of things, but they do nothing with spiritual opportunity. They never trust in Christ. They never depend on Christ. They put their faith in Christ. They don't love him. They have no desire to obey him. They just want to be religious. Find me a place to park myself so I can feel religious. See, he does not have genuine faith. And that's what is shown here by this man's actions. And 
Faith apart from works, as I said earlier, is dead faith. I don't care what you say you believe about Jesus. If you have no desire to serve him and no desire to obey him and no desire to walk with Christ, then you do not know Christ. He he saves you to change you. He doesn't save anybody to just leave them where they're at. He didn't leave Zacchaeus in the tree. If you read in Matthew 25, 30 about the talents, that's, a, that's a, another passage, a little bit different emphasis in that passage, but similar things going on there. When talking about the worthless slave in that passage, he says, throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So you see, this is not a believer. You don't throw believers into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's hell. So that's what I'm saying. This is not a believer. No repenting, no righteousness. He he, he thinks he is, but this judgment reveals that he's not. Verse 24, then he said to the bystanders, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. And they said to him, master, he has ten minas already. That's just how grace works, right? He was faithful. Uh, more is given. That's just how God's grace works. People think like that. God, he's getting more than me. But no, that's how grace works. God just, we don't understand God's grace. The worthless slave is stripped, wasted opportunity. Judgment reveals that. So we've seen the faithful and the false, right? The faithful and the false. My kingdom's not coming immediately, guys. There's going to be an interim period, and during that interim period, it's going to be a test. Who's genuine, who's not? Time when citizens are going to say that I will not have this man to reign over me. People are going to reject him. And then he's going to come back and judge them all, judge everybody. See how this parable went? Was it clear? You see that? Look at verse 27. Regarding those enemies of mine, the people in verse 14, who said, we do not want this man to reign over them. Those who were just outright, there's no, they weren't hiding behind anything. They were outright enemies. Bring them here and slay them in my presence. He reigns over everybody. <laughs> True believers, false believers, his enemies outright in the open enemies of Christ. He reigns over everybody, and everybody will be judged one day according to their deeds because the deeds give evidence of who you belong to. The question this morning is, who do you belong to? Are you a believer waiting for him to one day say to you, well done, good and faithful servant? Are you a false believer who's just hiding in the pews, saying all the right things, giving the impression that you know the Christ that you do not know? Or you're an enemy of Christ who just hates him, has nothing, wants nothing to do with him. There's a message for you in this sermon this morning, in this parable that Jesus preached on the road to Jerusalem. I pray you'll repent and turn to Christ if you don't know him. Cry out to him for salvation. Guess what happens next week? He finally gets to Jerusalem. For the next four chapters, it's going to take us six months to get him out of Jerusalem and onto the cross, to the resurrection. But the point is, that's where we're coming to next week. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth this morning. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.